The DNA story begins more than half a century ago with a group of brilliant, competitive, and temperamental young scientists all driven to uncover the same elusive mystery. And with Francis Crick and James Watson, two complete unknowns who somehow found what they were all looking for, the secret of life. To appreciate what Watson and Crick did, we have to imagine we're in the 1950s, and all that is known about life is what can be seen through a microscope. Cells dividing. They divide and divide again until somehow they eventually form a plant, a penguin, or a person. But how? How do the cells know what to do? Most believed there was a magical life force that would forever elude science, but some had faith in a more rational answer. Watson, this geeky American kid, with his friend Crick, who acted like some dandy English gentleman, a splendid talker who had never quite managed to finish his PhD. They were seen as lazy jokers, but they shared the same dream. Like other scientists of the time, they believed that there was some kind of a script or instruction that told cells what to do. The search for this script focused on the chromosomes, right in the middle of every cell. But that was as far as they could see. Still, it was known that chromosomes were made of two discrete ingredients, proteins and DNA. Most scientists expected to find the script in the proteins because they're really complicated and made up of lots of different chemicals, so they distracted the best minds. But Watson and Crick decided to look at the simpler DNA. DNA is composed of only four ingredients. They thought if they could work out how the atoms of these four ingredients were arranged in physical space, they might be able to work out what they did. They had a hunch that the three-dimensional structure of DNA might reveal its function. But while Watson and Crick had never found the structure of anything, 60 miles away in London worked another pair of scientists who had. Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins. Rosalind Franklin is often seen as the heroine of this story. She was Jewish from a wealthy background and had attended the best schools in England. She had chosen to become an expert in taking photographs of things that are too small to see. She's been called the dark lady of DNA as she died without ever getting credit for her part in the discovery. Well, here is one of the X-ray generators we're using in this work. Here is the X-ray tube. Wilkins's strange contraption is in fact a kind of camera. It's used in a technique called X-ray crystallography. A crystalline form of DNA is placed inside the camera, and when X-rays are fired through it, they scatter onto photographic paper and form a regular pattern. It's a bit like shining a spotlight at a chandelier. Light hits the crystals and then diffracts onto the wall. Now imagine you can't see the chandelier. You can only see the light on the wall. From that, you have to guess the shape of the chandelier. And that's what these photographs are. Taken by Morris Wilkins, they were the first clue to the structure of DNA. But his boss realized he was onto something big and decided to bring in an expert, Rosalind Franklin. Suddenly, it wasn't just Wilkins taking photographs of DNA. King's College London should have been the place to find the structure of DNA. King's had cutting edge equipment and a team of dedicated experts working on the problem. But trouble was brewing. While Morris Wilkins blended into the shadows, Rosalind Franklin was making a big impression on those around her. But her view was, you could build models all day. But how did you prove which one was right? 
On the other hand, if you made the measurements, you did all the corrective geometry, and you put them into the equations, you would let the data speak for itself. So at opposite ends of the corridor, Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin worked on DNA. Occasionally, they would announce their results to the department. One afternoon in November 1951, Franklin was to reveal her latest DNA data to a select group of King's College scientists and one outsider. Well, this is where I came in, early November 1951, to hear uh, Rosalind Franklin talk about her newest results on DNA. And uh, I was terribly keen to know what she'd done because uh, uh, I wanted to build a model and I thought I would learn possibly something about the structure. There was probably you know, 30 people in the room and you know, I slipped in, so you know, it was inside us, you know, like a spy. And uh, Rosalind you know, was seemingly much in control. I generally never took notes, my memory was good. Having taken in as much as he could of the X-ray data, Watson rushed back to Cambridge to tell Crick what he'd heard. For the next two weeks, they worked on a model, and on November 28, 1951, Watson and Crick announced that they had found the structure of DNA. Francis rang me up and said, we've made a model, come have a look. So, I went to the others and collected them, and we all went up. It was a pretty ugly structure. Francis liked that, I don't know. It, you know, he called up the people at King's and said we'd done something clever, and uh, I was a bit worried. Feeling apprehensive, the King's team left for Cambridge. Rosalind Franklin took one look at the model, and... She laughed at them. Uh, much to their discomfiture, I think, and uh, said, oh, look. You've got it inside out. Watson's memory had let him down over how much water was absorbed in the DNA crystals. The water content is vital to the structure, so their model was a complete disaster. Rosalind was tickled pink. She was right. The building of a model of a crystal structure was a waste of time until you'd let diffraction speak for itself. And that was hard work. I don't know, I mean, um, one might say, well, why not? I mean, it's an exploration to make a model. I mean, make a model, and if you make a bit of a fool of yourself in the process, why worry? You might uh, be, be lucky. The real, most strange thing about science is how stupid people can be so much of the time. And uh, so Francis and I were really stupid. Worse than that, they'd incurred the wrath of the London team's boss, Sir John Randall, who called up Watson and Crick's boss, Sir Lawrence Bragg, to complain about their behavior. And Bragg was furious. In those days, it wasn't gentlemanly to have knowledge of somebody's current unpublished work and to make use of that working on the same problem. It was rather like uh, having an affair with his wife. I mean, it happened, but you, uh, you, you didn't really take much credit in doing it. Watson and Crick were kicked off the case, and even their model-building equipment was sent to King's. Watson and Crick were officially barred from the race. The way should have been open for the King's College team but Morris and Rosalind didn't get along. With the stakes so high, why couldn't they just resolve their differences? Watson was down in the dumps, banned from working on DNA. His dream of showing that it was the secret of life was slipping away. But Crick had some good news. Someone was coming to dinner in Cambridge who could help them. They were fishing, really. The, but that, I uh, get the impression, uh, they did all the time. I think Watson really uh, was a fisherman. I mean, he, he sort of brought the news to Crick. Crick was apparently the man who had the ideas. Well, I think we didn't like him because he 
sort of didn't, you know, warm up to our saying, you know, you could solve the structure of DNA by model building, you know. Despite his extreme dislike for them, he did explain his Chargaff rules that state the relative amounts of the four basic ingredients of DNA. By comparing samples from three different species, he discovered a strange correlation. No matter what the life form, the amount of A equaled the amount of T, and the amount of C equaled the amount of G. This suggested the chemicals somehow went together in pairs. For Chargaff, this was an interesting correlation, but for Watson and Crick, it was the first clue to the structure. Back at King's College, London, they had made an astonishing discovery. The scattered dots of light that suggest how the atoms of DNA might be arranged were coming into sharp focus. Rosalind Franklin had taken this, the clearest picture yet. The X pattern indicated that DNA ingredients are arranged in a spiral, what scientists call a helix. But Rosalind Franklin wasn't letting anyone else see it. Watson was still not even supposed to be working on DNA, but he took the risk of going to King's again. I didn't have that much time. I wanted something to happen now. So I went down and looked for Morris and didn't spot him, and someone told me where Rosalind's office was. So I went toward it and uh, walked in. She wasn't there. You know, I wasn't trying to read the letters on her desk or anything like that, but obviously I was looking around and she came in. And someone had told her that I was looking for her. She had a very negative reaction to me. And fury was rising. She didn't think I should be there. So I got out of the room as fast as possible, and then Morris Wilkins had heard I was around, and there he was, and I said, oh, I, I thought she was going to hit me. And he said, oh, I thought she was going to do that to me once. And uh, so I went to, <laughs> he took me to his office and opened a drawer and took out a photo, and there it was, the cross, which I had never seen, and which they had basically weren't talking about. It, it showed this sort of, uh, X type of um, oxo type of um, cross pattern, which was an indication of a helix. I was at a big high. I mean, this is the most beautiful photograph, you know, it's as if you've seen the most beautiful girl in the world and you're going to see her again. You know, it was great. If I got excited about the results, I tended to pass them on. I don't know, I think it. Uh, I didn't feel there was any sort of bombshell in this. Well, the picture kept sort of racing through my brain, and uh, I wanted to be sure I had it right, so I wrote it down. It was just a, a super reflection in 3.4 angstroms, and boom, boom, boom. No one could look at it and say it's not a helix. And the reason that Watson realized that it was a helix? So as you get a cross, in the diffraction pattern. Well, it just so happened that Crick knew this bit of X-ray diffraction theory and had told Watson that an X indicated a helix. This wasn't his specialty, but Crick's mind was able to absorb ideas from many disciplines, and now it was paying off. And there's going to be a tendency to throw... Yeah, you know, I felt, you know, maybe we'll get the answer, you know. Until then, I, I didn't feel we were close. I felt a picture means we're close. Yeah, it would have been impossible not to build bottles then after seeing that picture. <laughs> Spring came early to Cambridge in 1953. Watson and Crick were given official permission to return to their work on DNA. And by now, they had managed to acquire all the information they needed. Chargaff's data suggested that the four chemicals in DNA might go together in pairs. It was time to see how these pairs would fit together, to discover whether the shape of DNA would tell them what it did. So I came in the morning and I began moving them around. And I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small. So how did you do it? Somehow you had to, to form link bonds. So uh, here's uh, A and here's T, and uh, I wanted this hydrogen 
to point directly at this nitrogen. So I had something like this. Oh. So then I went to the, the pair. I wanted this nitrogen to point to this one. It went like this. Whoa, they look the same. So we had two base pairs identical in shape. And boy, I could hardly believe it. Franklin's photo suggested these pairs had to fit into some kind of helix. And when they saw that the pairs were the same shape, they realized that they could stack on top of each other. You can put one right on top of the other. And they realized that to form a helix, they not only stacked on top of each other, but they also twisted around, like the steps in a spiral staircase, onwards and upwards. In their minds, the double helix structure of DNA emerged. So you can have a small one, a big one, a small one, any sequence. We knew we could just, you know, even if we go up to the ceiling, we were building a, a tiny fraction of a molecule. Hundred a million of these base pairs in one molecule. So unbelievably, all united by this either AT or TA, GC, CG, all fitting into this wonderful symmetry which we saw the morning of February 28th, uh, 1953. The double helix was a structure that revealed far more about the way life works than they could ever have dreamed of. They'd been looking for something that could divide, just like cells do, and it was easy to see how a double helix could unwind and form two more double helixes. They'd been trying to find out if DNA was the script or instructions for all living things. They realized that the millions of G's, A's, T's, and C's must be written in some kind of code, the script of life. And they even saw how the script could be copied exactly. As the double helix unwinds, each of the letters forms a new pair. And because A always goes with T and G always goes with C, the resulting two pieces of DNA are exact copies of the original, enabling the script to be passed from cell to cell and ultimately from generation to generation. It was clear now, DNA was the molecule that controlled all living things.